But when you then look at what's left, the the 5% or so consistently over the years that couldn't be explained, views differed. appear to demonstrate advanced technology. And two things that were specifically mentioned were radio frequency energy and signature management. So we know looking at the, the UFO data, we have that the capability is pretty darned impressive. Speeds, maneuvers, acceleration. Always have a plan B. Yes. Yes. We say in the, uh, or we used to say when I was in the military, um, no plan survives first contact. Yes, absolutely. I, I learned being a civilian employee of the MOD, I learned a whole lot of those from my military colleagues, including the famous saying, never get separated from your kit, which was shortly followed by the guy in question saying, oh my God, where's my laptop? And running back to the office we'd been in about 20 minutes ago. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I could take that one stage further and say, getting separated from your kit is fine. Just don't get separated from your sleeping bag. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an absolute honor, Nick, to have you on, on the show. Um, over to you. How, how did you first take an interest in this subject? I was simply given this to do as a government job. I was a civilian employee of the Ministry of Defense. And as you know, as in the military, our civil servants get posted every, every few years to something completely different. And in 1991, uh, the UFO job at the Ministry of Defense happened to become vacant at the exact time when I was due for a, a move in a situation where the line manager was someone that I'd already worked with in the Joint Operations Center, where I'd been seconded into the Air Force Operations Room. So it was just almost chance that I fell into this topic. I had no interest in UFOs. I had no particular beliefs. I was simply assigned, this is going to be your job for the next three years. And when I say the job, what I mean is handling the policy for the topic and researching and investigating it to assess defense implications, if any, for the UK. What year was this, Nick? 91 to 94. Was that not also round about the time, if I remember correctly, that, that, that the UK government came out and said that they shelved all their UFO files because there was nothing in it? Or am I getting my wires that crossed? Yeah, that, that was a little later. That was actually in 2009, when after decades of having had this program, the MOD did pull the plug as, as part of a, you know, better than I, the usual series of defense cuts. Uh, but in when I was there from 91 to 94, it was still going strong. And we'd had someone doing that job since 1953. So many, many different people over the years had been in this particular position and some after me as well. But you're right. They, they did eventually pull the plug, though rumors persist that they are still looking at it. And of course, with everything going on in the United States now, which we can come on to, to talk about, the MOD may well have to re-engage on this. Yes, I get a bit suspicious when they say they pulled it. The plug. It's a bit like the MK Ultra experiment in the USA, the CIA mind control um, exercises and operations, which which clearly seem to have worked. That the notion that if you could control another human being, um, for example, a foreign foreign leader or maybe a prominent celebrity figure, that you just go, "Oh, we're not going to do that anymore." <laughs> it it it's with the psychopaths that are in control of the planet, I, I find that in, incredibly unlikely. So um, um, when the British came out with that statement, you, I don't think we're ever going to know, are we? No, and I've heard from various well-placed 
defense sources that despite the public statements, people are still researching and investigating this behind the scenes, but outside of the scope of any formally constituted program. So it's been done in the margins of other work streams, maybe even contracted out to the private sector, which is something that the US government did. It's, it's something we did back in the 90s. We had at one point, we did an intelligence assessment of the phenomenon as a whole. And that we put out into the private sector through an existing defense contract. We modified it and, and put it out to one of the big uh, defense corporations just to take it a little bit outside the system, a little bit of clear blue water between the work and the government, a little bit of plausible deniability, and of course, to make it more difficult for people to get at it under the Freedom of Information Act. Ah, uh, yes, I haven't thought of that. And when you took on this role, Nick, was there any um, thoughts in your mind that you might actually witness an alien craft? No, I, I, I really didn't know what to expect. And um, government UFO research and investigation is, is I, I think, different from what most people might think. I think people, people watching this podcast might think it was like a, an X-Files situation, running around, you know, weapons drawn in, in dark warehouses and, and torches out and things like that. In, in reality, it was much more headquarters-based, revolved around things like um, radar analysis, photographic and imagery analysis, um, MAZINT, interviewing pilots, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so, so, no, I, I didn't have expectation of seeing anything or experiencing myself. And, and neither did I expect that at some point I would be taken to some RAF base and they would roll aside the hangar doors and say, there it is. And, and only for me to see, you know, what crashed at Roswell or something, but back engineered and put together. No, I was not expecting that. And sadly, I, I didn't experience that. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and was there an acknowledge? was there an understanding at the time of the with, within the government, I mean, of the difference between interplanetary craft or, or beings and interdimensional? Within the Ministry of Defense and wider, within the wider military and the intelligence community, there was no there was no common view on what we were dealing with. I think there was a, a sort of intellectual understanding just from the previous decades of investigations that most of the sightings, of course, would turn out to be misidentifications of ordinary objects and phenomena. But when you then look at what's left, the, the 5% or so consistently over the years that couldn't be explained, views differed. Some people were skeptical and they said, well, with just a bit more investigation, we might find a conventional answer. But others weren't afraid to sort of think about some of the more exotic possibilities. Some people talked about extraterrestrials, other people interdimensional. Some people said, what about time travelers from the future? Some people even took a religious view of all this and thought it was demonic. I mean, really views within the Ministry of Defense mirror views within society. There's a whole lot of skeptics, some believers, and people in between. So let's, let's jump in a time machine ourselves, Nick, from where you were when you started to where you are now, and then we'll kind of... Um, um, it will be interesting to see how we get to this point with when we then go back to the beginning of your story or your your ufo story what what is your understanding now of of the whole shebang well i'm not one of these people that's going to sit and tell you i've got the answer and i've solved the mystery because i haven't and i'm always wary when it comes to this subject 
of people, and I see them all the time. I, I see various sort of you know self-styled UFO experts sort of say, "Oh, this is what it is." And in reality, those of us who've looked at this from within government never say that. What we say is that there, there's no one single neat answer to this mystery. There's a whole range probably of different things going on, most conventional, some maybe not so. Um, and, and as to what we're dealing with, I don't know. But I mean, a very good case in point is the report that was just sent in the US from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to the United States Congress. And most people have seen or that follow this subject, an unclassified nine page summary of this. There is in the system, uh, apparently an 18 page classified version. And this is mainly gone in Congress to, to both the Senate and the House. And it's mainly the Senate Intelligence Committee that is leading on this. And what they have been briefed, and people can read the unclassified version for themselves. I mean, it's, it's quite a bombshell. It says, this is a real phenomenon, no one single cause, but detected across multiple platforms. So we have pilot sightings. We have radar operators corroborating this. We have forward-looking infrared camera videos of these things, uh, most famously from, from US Navy jets. A lot of people have seen those those videos, uh, electro-optical weapon seekers, um, former director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe talked about satellite imagery. And then critically, this report went on to say that in a handful of cases, these UFOs appear to demonstrate advanced technology. And two things that were specifically mentioned were radio frequency energy and signature management. So that's where we are right now. After decades of this subject being viewed almost with a chuckle as some sort of conspiracy theory, science fiction, fringe topic, it has come out of the fringe and is firmly in the mainstream with, with Congress in the US now taking this seriously and saying, thanks for this preliminary assessment. We need more work on this because whatever we're dealing with, and this is the headline conclusion of the report, it's an air safety threat and a potential national security challenge. And we need to find out, is this, is this Russia? Is this China? Or is it something else? And we don't know. I see. That's where the threat comes in, if it's more, more of a human thing. Well, even if it's extraterrestrial, we still apply, and you've probably applied this yourself in your career, the threat equation of capability times intent equals threat. So we know looking at the, the UFO data, we have that the capability is pretty darned impressive. Speeds, maneuvers, acceleration that, that seem to leave the cutting edge of our own aerospace technology standing. But the intent remains unknown and, and therefore we can't assess the threat. But as you know, it's, it's hope for the best, plan for the worst. Yes, I don't believe in nation, this nation state thing. I think it's all just, I think it's all a bit mythical that Russia are the bad guys this week and oh, hang on, China. I'm not, just, I'm not suggesting that um, big things aren't happening in those, those countries. I'm just sure if they had some space program that every single country and intelligence agency in the world would know what they were well we know we uh when we did this intelligence assessment at the mod in the 90s we knew from intelligence sources that russia and china and other nations too had their own ufo programs and they're probably asking the same questions that we were asking you, you know i you, you know in russia somewhere there's probably a intelligence community analyst saying i wonder if any of this is secret us black project technology spy planes drones something not yet publicly declared 
Yes. Well, I, I should tell you my um my experience of of a UFO. When I was about seven, we had some family friends. They were slightly older, so they would have been comprehensive kids. And obviously, I was in the primary school. And one day, there was a massive article in our local paper that um, these two teenagers, they'd been uh, taking their dog for a walk in the park. And suddenly, the dog started growling and, and barking up in the air and when they looked up there was this strange cigar shaped object and which only explanation for it was uh, that it had to have been a ufo and i remember re reading this as a child thinking oh my god <laughs> and then um, when i spoke to my mum about it, she said uh no, they just made it all up. <laughs> they just phoned up the newspaper and come out with this um, somewhat cock and bull story. Um, so, but back to the um, the serious stuff, Nick. So, how did things? Um, we'll, we'll 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 talk about your story, and then we'll cover such things such as possible propulsion methods and. Um, and, and technology and uh, um, well, just what what could this really be about? So what you settled into the role, what sort of stuff did you have have to start doing? You talked about chatting with pilots? Yes, I know it's a huge cliche, but there was no typical day in that office and I did I did have other duties too. I, I mean just as, nothing to do with this topic, but just as a fun piece of, of information. One of the other things that I did while I was in that post is I was responsible for reading draft manuscripts of books written by military or ex-military people who had been involved in the, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War. And I, I was the guy or one of the guys with the black pens going, no, we can't have that in. <laughs> wow, let's talk about that because um well, I'm not sure there's there's much I can say, but I I looked for example at the the air parts and, and now I was a civilian as I say, but I was I was in an air force secretariat division. So I looked at the bits that related to air power in General Sir Peter de Villiers book. I, then I looked at, um, gosh, what was that? Uh, very, very kind of quirkily written book, Pablo's War, I think. That was uh, uh, one I, I remember. Then, of course, the, the two, two guys who were shot down, um, uh, Nichols and Scott. I, it's, it's years since I've even thought about this, frankly. Yes, torna tornado down. Tornado down, yes, yes. And you know, my job wasn't to be a killjoy. It was just to make sure that inadvertently no classified information had had slipped in. But I'm just I'm just really giving you a little bit of, I, I guess, color to say that there were other things I was doing in that job too. Aside, and I had I had responsibilities for updating the NATO war books again on on the air side. So interesting times. <laughs> yes, it sounds like the same. Um military officers tried to censor this podcast in the in the past well and then of course as as i think you've probably heard and i'm probably going to get the joke wrong but there's the old joke that um where people used to say that sas stood for special author service <laughs> was there any um was there any talk then that some of these memoirs may um let's just say may not all have been what they what what they seemed oh no no they they were all i mean they were all you know heroes and people of the highest integrity mm. and who had done their level best to make sure themselves that they didn't break any rules it's just we were the we were the headquarters people who maybe had a, a sort of wider political perspective on this and we we just acted as almost like a long stop 
to make sure nothing had slipped through because you know you can get 99.9 percent of it right and make one little inadvertent slip and and then you know once it's out you can't get the toothpaste back into the tube so so that that was what we were we were doing like you know I, people have this view of us being these these kind of killjoy bureaucrats and things but but we were really just trying to make sure for example that we didn't inadvertently give away something like the the capability of of an air defense radar system or something like that yeah and also you have to protect the individual um so if you've got assets in another country that might still be there in danger you can't be saying that you know they lived on this street or or this kind of thing no and of course that's exactly what we're seeing right now tragically with the afghanistan situation and the the debt that we owe to those who helped us that we haven't been able to get out mm. yes absolutely uh, awful situation but then it's been awful for 20 20 years um yes and that's another story so you're talking to these in between uh, when you're not uh taking your red pen to these books <laughs> or your black, black pen what what's what are the stories that you're hearing well on on the ufo side um as i say there was no typical day so we got about two or three hundred ufo reports each year mostly from the public but you know, a, a reasonable proportion from police officers pilots other military personnel and so we would have to we have to interview the witness take down all the information then start the investigation which would basically be a series of checks we knew for example where all the things that people misidentify for ufos were operating so we would cross check the date time and description with flight paths with with military exercises or or training with weather balloon launches with satellite tracks astronomical data and we would consult as necessary with the radar experts with intelligence community imagery analysts if we had photos or videos uh, we would consult with meteorologists with astronomers and one by one we would we would explain away these sightings until we were left with the ones that we couldn't explain and and then you have the kind of catch 22 situation that it's like it's like a police investigation when when you've investigated to the point where you you can't solve the mystery it just sits there on the file as an open case but eventually you can't really put any more resources into it and it just sits there and until the point and that point may never come but until the point where some new piece of evidence a, a witness a document whatever it might be emerges so that was part of it the bread and butter of the job was doing the investigations but we also when this subject came up in parliament i would be the one as as the subject matter expert i would be the one drafting the speeches the responses to the parliamentary questions whatever it was drafting that for secretary of state for defense or or the under secretaries whoever it it was when the subject came up in the media as it obviously did a lot i would be the one drafting the the key messages and the defensive lines to take and the background information for the press office and you know sometimes literally you'd have school kids writing in and saying we're doing a project on this can you help and of course in in the interests of good publicity i i would always do my best to to help with things like that dig out some documents from the national archives for example famously in 1952 winston churchill wrote a memo about ufo's and he said what does all this stuff about flying saucers mean what does it amount to um what's the truth let me have a report well every time a kid wrote in and said we're doing a school project i would make sure they had that document and they would they would go to their teacher and say look this came from the ministry of defense and it's from winston churchill and and they loved it so there was a fun part of the job too and and then of course there's all the public correspondence which could be anything 
from you know, serious questions. We didn't at the time, it was too early for the Freedom of Information Act, thank goodness, but we had a lot of questions and we tried to be helpful when possible. And we had a lot of accusations too. Of course, to many, many people, they thought we were the bad guys handling the cover up and the conspiracy as they viewed it. So we had to respond politely but robustly to that. And can you give us some examples, Nick, of um, obviously, air, air, I mean, I'm guessing air, military aircraft can be mistaken for UFOs, but what sort of things were the public reporting that turned out to be, um, you know, turned out to be legit or there was an explanation behind it? Well, this was after my time, but certainly in recent years, many, many UFO reports have been attributable to people letting off Chinese lanterns. I, I can't recall exactly when the Chinese lantern thing became a big deal in the UK, but the moment it did, UFO spi uh, sightings spiked quite, quite rapidly. But of course, the danger then is you throw out the baby with the bathwater. And everyone says, oh, it's just Chinese lanterns. And of course, what they really should say is a, an increasing proportion of it was, was Chinese lanterns. But we, we were never interested in those conventional explanations, except when, when we could, you know, we wanted to get better identify and then discarding them so that we could concentrate on the really interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that did cause, one conventional thing, during my time there that caused a lot of um, excitement was, was the, the Virgin light ships airship. And this was, you know, Richard Branson used to fly this thing and then loan it out to the TV companies. So it would be filming big football matches at Wembley stadium. And of course it would be for evening kickoffs. It would be hovering over Northwest London. And if you were in Northwest London, you could see it. It was an airship and it would say it on the side. But if you were looking at it from several miles away, we, we would find ourselves getting reports of you know, brightly illuminated cigar-shaped objects hovering over London. Uh, lasers and searchlights became a much bigger thing with outdoor pop events and rock festivals. So people were, were using huge World War II style searchlights, but also much more modern laser systems that sometimes um, tracked around the skies in symmetrical patterns. That sort of thing generated a lot of UFO sightings. Um, we, so we had to be, and, and satellites were becoming more prevalent. There were more and more of them. And that's a huge thing now, of course, with, with some of these, what are they called, Starlink ones particularly. So we had to be ahead of the curve when it came to what was out there. We had to know who is flying what, um, when and where, and what other phenomena like astronomical things, satellites, meteor showers, even the cycle of meteor showers. We had to be on top of all that. Yeah, so I used to... Um when you're in areas that don't have light pollution, you can see lots of satellites and quite frequently, at least one every 20 minutes, you see tracking over. Um, I, do, I do wonder if people that buy into this flat earth theory understand that, <laughs> that you can actually see the satellites and if they do and if they have seen and what, what, how do, what, they, what do they think they are? Um, well, indeed, yes. But, uh, I'm, I'm just staggered that that whole flat Earth thing has has come back and is even a thing. But I think it's it's one of two things. I mean, firstly, like a lot of things, it's probably just fueled by the internet. Um, and and secondly, I can't help but wonder whether it isn't the whole thing isn't some sort of um, either practical joke that's got out of hand or more likely maybe a, a, some sort of psychology study in belief. You know, let's, let's do a control experiment where we put, put some stuff out there and see if it takes off, and it has. Yeah, I think the reality would probably be it's, it's a PSYOP designed to discredit 
anybody that questions the mainstream media narrative. Say, for example, you've got concerns over what you see in the news. The public just write you off as a, oh, you're one of those flat earthers, aren't you? Yes. Um, and of course, we see that. I mean, the whole issue of psyops and misinformation, disinformation, fake news. I mean, look how, I mean, I don't want to, maybe we shouldn't go down this particular rabbit hole, but look how the whole idea that, that COVID-19, even if it emerged naturally, may have been tinkered with in, in this so-called um, uh, addition of function situation at the Wuhan virology lab. And that whole thing was dismissed as some sort of right-wing nut job conspiracy theory until it wasn't. And, and until President Biden asked Director of National Intelligence, I want to report on this. And as you know, that report's just come in and it's inc inconclusive. There are eight, 18 different parts of the US intelligence community. Some of them think it, it's completely natural. Some think that there was addition of function. So, so one person's conspiracy theory is another person's questioning the narrative. And I, I think it's a sad day when we stop questioning the narrative. You said it, Nick, most definitely. I have a really simple, um, if I say dipstick, do our younger people know what I'm talking about? You know, my, my test to stick is really simple. Did, did you see it on the news? Yes, then it's not true. <laughs> on that point then let I, i'm interested to know so this office you work for what level of critical thinking skills did your colleagues or the the the, the executive at this office what did they have and if i can pitch an idea to you i mean were they were they in a position where they would question for, say, the moon landings? Or was, was, that, you know, was, no, that, was, I, that, was that taboo or was it all taken as gospel? Well, that was, that was really outside our, our brief. As to what people thought about that privately, I don't really know. My, my guess would be that most people in the MOD um, – thought you know did not did not think the moon landings were were hoaxed but right. maybe some did but it's it's not it's not really something that came up i mean we we didn't treat the ufo mystery as some sort of conspiracy theory we we treated it and the way it's been treated in the us right now quite correctly we treated this as a, a defense and national security issue there's something in our airspace we want to know what it is yes the reason I ask is when you when you moved more towards the sort of quantum physics side and methods of propulsion, this this kind of thing, then you start to realize that to actually travel through space, you, you'd really need advanced technology. I mean, even um, um, what was the chap from Op Operation Paperclip, the German scientist? Werner von Braun. Yeah, even von Braun said um, to go to the moon, you, you'd need so much, if, if indeed it was possible, you'd need so much fuel that, that at minimum, just to get out of Earth's orbit, you, you'd need a rocket the size of the Empire State Building, right? This is Werner von Braun, who's the father of... Uh, the rocket program <laughs> was saying himself impossible and, and what i'm getting at is nick is if the people in charge of your office aren't in a position to even question the the official narrative on space i i i just wonder where sort of where it was all going well we did not make as much progress as I would have liked, but speaking directly to your point, things changed in later years, and particularly in the United States. And the point you raised brings me very 
neatly to the subject of ATIP, Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program. Now, as you know, for years, the US government said, we are no longer investigating UFOs. We haven't done so since Project Blue Book was closed down at the end of 1969. And there's no corporate interest in that. Then in December 2017, the New York Times ran a front page story to say that there had been this program called ATIP, that they had looked at UFOs. And that's when they also released the fact that US Navy pilots had seen, tracked on radar, and filmed on forward looking infrared camera video uh, these, these UFOs. And now here's where it gets interesting and ties back to what you said about quantum physics and propulsion systems. The Defense Intelligence Agency obviously were, were asked hard questions about this by Congress. Congress said, hey, you told us you weren't doing this. And now we learn in the New York Times that you are. What's going on? So the DIA wrote to Congress in January 2018 saying, yes, we had a program called ATIP, but it looked at, and they tried to spin it, next generation aerospace and weapon threats to the United States, which sounds, you know, all, all proper stuff, core defense business. Yes, you'd expect them to be looking at that. Then they attached to that letter a list of 38 scientific and technical studies that they'd done under the ATIP contract. If this was indeed all about next generation aerospace and weapon threats, you know, how many of those papers would you expect to be about Russia and China? Probably most of them with, with some maybe on Iran and North Korea and, and things like that. None of them, none of them were about Russia or China. They were all about exotic theoretical physics concepts. There was a paper on anti-gravity. There was a paper on invisibility, a paper on stargates, a paper on warp drive, and a paper on wormholes. This was all about the technology that you would need for interstellar travel. And just in case anyone still thinks, well, maybe it was still about Russia or China, but, but just really thinking ahead, one of the studies was about the Drake equation. And the only purpose of the Drake equation is to estimate the number of communicable civilizations in our galaxy. So it was hidden in plain sight. The, the letter to Congress tried to dress this up as being about aerospace threats, conventional ones. But the reality and the attachment was that this was about UFO technology. And so ATIP was the opposite of the program that I ran at the MOD. Instead of taking the UFO sightings and investigating them, they took as their start point, I believe, the assumption that this was real, and then asked the smart question, well, what technologies are involved in this, and can we acquire them? And there is some declassified paperwork that bears that out and, and says that that is indeed what they were trying to do. And just to put it in perspective, if you pointed the fastest space probe we've ever designed at the nearest star to our sun, I mean, the nearest star to us aside from the sun, it would take 75,000 years to get there. So clearly there is a new physics involved here or a new understanding of the laws of physics, energy sources, propulsion systems that we don't currently possess. And there is a race going on to acquire that. It's interesting you say propulsion because I'd say it's the other way around. I'd say it's um, pulling. What's the, what's the scientific name for, for pulling yourself to something? As opposed I, to I know. I mean, it's all, it, that's all part and parcel of warping space-time because... Um, you know what if if you view as einstein viewed space time as a single entity rather than two separate things 
then a sufficiently massive, ob well, any massive object will warp space-time to some extent. And if you could, if you could control and dramatically increase that, you could, theoretical physicists believe, majorly warp space-time. And therefore, it's like the old thing. If you take a, a sheet of paper and you draw a point A at one end and point B on the other, you then draw a line between them. That's a long line. But if you then fold the paper, you can juxtapose those two points. That's essentially what that technology would, would try to do. Yes, exactly. And, and people think it's science fiction, but then, as I say, I can show them that the Defense Intelligence Agency has briefed Congress that they were working on that very thing. Now, there's still, of course, a huge challenge involved in turning theoretical physics into something that can be engineered. But the important point is that people are working on it. So this isn't sci-fi. This isn't some sort of fringe conspiracy theory. Some people in government, the military, the intelligence community, the aerospace community are actively working on this to try and figure it out. Yes. Oh, it, it just begs so many questions. And there's so many implications of that in it in itself, whether they actually feel there's something out there or whether this is a to do with budgets. Um siphoning off money from the public purse um not mentioning any uh american companies uh in in particular um nick we talked about the the um the sightings that were able to be explained can you give us some examples of the ones that either couldn't or in which you felt Blimey, that this actually really might be something. Sure. Well, I mean, gosh, where to start? We we had a case in August 1990 where two hikers in Scotland photographed. They took six photos of a diamond-shaped craft in daylight um, with you know the the sort of various landmarks in the background, so that that intelligence community imagery analysts could could work their magic and triangulate and come up with some calculations about size distance from the camera etc and this was looked at by by the defense intelligence staff it was looked at by um JARIC, joint air reconnaissance and intelligence center now part of the defense fusion center i think and this thing pretty much hovered there for for some time and then it disappeared up but straight up vertically so so that was a pretty good one and we had for years an enlarged uh, poster sized copy of the best photo on our office wall uh, until it disappeared in somewhat mysterious circumstances so we that that was a great case then we had there was a um, case in 1993 where we had um, dozens if not hundreds of sightings on one one night over a period of about um, six hours large triangular shaped craft capable of moving from a hover to high max speeds in an instant with no sonic boom which was kind of curious uh, a low frequency humming sound coming from these craft sometimes one of the military witnesses said it was so unpleasant he could feel the sound reverberating through his body as well as hear it. Um, huge, huge thing. Hundreds of witnesses, police, military, civilians, uh, lots of different parts of the UK. Uh, there was a case in Belgium in 1990 where a similar craft flew over the, the countryside for some hours. The Belgians scrambled two F-16s to intercept it because they were tracking it on radar. The F-16s then acquired it on their airborne radar, but the object broke lock multiple times and uh, they, they never got to the bottom of it. The Belgian, the official view from the Belgian Air Force and, and the Belgian Ministry of Defense was real, 
unidentified. And thank goodness it was friendly because if it hadn't been, frankly, there was nothing we'd, we'd have been able to do about it. And, and the cases go on and on. I mean, there are, there are hundreds of these sorts of things. The MOD over the last few years has declassified and released about 60,000 pages of, of documents about all this. Some of them had previously been at levels up to secret UK eyes only. Gosh. What, uh, what are the theories then on propulsion, Nick? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking if you're that clever, let, let's take the inner, interplanetary travel as opposed to the interdimensional. So for friends at home who might not be familiar with the terminology, I'm not pretending I'm, I massively am, but I get the difference between interplanetary, obviously traveling from another planet, another solar system, galaxy, what have you, and interdimensional as in we're here there, we're, we're here in this dimension. If we were to maybe tweak the frequency a notch, we might enter an, uh, uh, another or, or a bit like the sort of maybe there's a Chris Thrall in another dimension and he's you know three seconds bit behind this one or or there's an infinite amount of Chris Thralls committing an infinite infinite amount of actions in an infinite infinite amount of dimensions etc etc sure so so that one I. I'd, I'd have no idea about, but for actual interplanetary travel, I, I would Im imagine you would need to um, be able to manipulate the mole molecular structure of, of space. Yes, you, you would have to warp space-time, and however that was done that would involve vast amounts of energy, which is one of the reasons why this is so highly classified, because anything that involves high energy can almost certainly be weaponized. So, so that's one angle of it. I, I will answer that in more detail, but let me just circle back to your comment about interdimensional, because that's really, I think, fascinating. Um, the, and, and the whole idea of interdimensional uh, intrusion ties in with with the idea that you just mentioned about parallel universes and and there are certainly some theoretical physicists who believe absolutely that 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 there are an infinite number of parallel universes so but and a few years ago this would have been laughed out of court but now people like the theoretical physicist Michio Kaku are actively researching the existence of so-called hidden dimensions using, for example, the big particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider. And, and again, that's about slamming particles together to create new exotic particles, um, very high energies. And for string theory, or for some branches of string theory, you actually need multiple dimensions for the equations to work. So, so watch very closely what happens over the next few years at the Large Hadron Collider, because it may be that that particular science fiction, as many believed, is about to become science fact. And some people believe that UFOs and maybe other paranormal phenomena more generally is indeed some sort of leakage across from different dimensions or from parallel universes. But to take your other point, if this is simply extraterrestrial uh, technology and interstellar travel, as opposed to, say, interdimensional or time travel or something like that, uh, then yes, it, it would involve, it's not just a, a faster rocket, it's probably something with a radically different technology. And, you know, optimists say we could figure it out. But pessimists say probably not. And they say, look, look, in a in a universe nearly 14 billion years old, there might be civilizations out there with, with a billion years head start on us. And their technology to us would be indistinguishable from magic. I mean, ask yourself, that's it's nowhere near a, a billion years, but a, a few 
you know, a few thousand years, if you could go back in time and show a Stone Age person your smartphone, they'd just think it was a shiny rock. And then you smash it into pieces. Are they going to be able to, to figure out what it, what it does? Are they going to be able to replicate that technology and build their own? Of course not. And, and then people say, well, maybe we could take UFOs and back engineer them and figure it out. Well, maybe not. Yes. And there's also the point that, you know, if, 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 if these aliens were that advanced that they could travel in this way, I'm pretty sure, sh- this is just, just a theory, a personal theory. I, I'm pretty sure they'd realise that you couldn't, you couldn't use fuel because when you take from Mother Nature, you've got to be able to, it's got to be sustainable. And I don't mean sustainable the way it's being used in our current society because at all our sustainable, it, it's not really sustainable, is it? It still involves digging up the earth, digging out the minerals, digging up the, 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 the metals and the precious metals that, that are not just going to, grow back like say for example a tree might and i just wonder wouldn't these aliens be so clever to know that that is not the way forward yes yeah i I mean they probably would have realized hang on guys let's just stay at home and get things sorted out here and if we go to that planet earth we're just going to give them this crazy radical idea, and then they, then they're going to those idiots are going to try and build their and and they're kind of like destroying their planet at a very rapid rate. Well, I think I think one of the interesting points about all this is that if if you believe that there are other civilizations out there. There's almost certainly not just one other civilization out there, but multiple civilizations, perhaps billions or trillions in in the universe. So so I think it's very difficult to say aliens would do this or wouldn't do that because there's probably such a a variety that that it's on a spectrum. And uh, yes, one would hope that that a a civilization would, would maybe try to solve its own problems before it becomes a spacefaring civilization but maybe not maybe may, i mean we 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 have the infancy of a space program i mean it's it's baby steps but it's still there i mean we we're a long way from sorting out all our problems like war and disease and poverty and prejudice yeah the, the, and, the know, big problem the big problem then nick is that we we've been in infantilized if that in, in if that's right like we've been kept as children our whole lives and not allowed to develop into the right hemisphere of our brain which is your love your kindness your empathy your, your human understanding and because we haven't done that we're still in this we still have we still live in this childish world of notions that oh my god well you know this country wants to wage war with us and all oh, let's go to that planet when when you when when you when you find enlightenment you realize that so much of that is just fabricated people don't hate each other they just don't i've traveled the whole world several times and you meet the odd idiot but most people just full of love for one another and the I just think there's another dimension here that's not discussed, and that is if 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 we didn't live in what I call the left brain, where we just believe what we see in mainstream media, we're full of anger, hatred, bigotry, greed, we're slave to our um, kind of bestial desires, rather than living in our upper self, which is what the Eastern philosophy is all about. I think if we all found, if if we could find a way to break free from the the chains or the indoctrination that was subjected to from birth in order to make us 
just greedy consumers that believe the 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 mainstream media narrative so we keep the military industrial complex going we keep programs like nasa funded we 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 keep the the these trillionaires in the um greedy state of power of which they become accustomed to i i think we'd find us selves in a paradise where it's like what go to the dude why <laughs> what what like it's perfect here so the point i'm getting to is if aliens were that advanced that they could travel through either space or time or, or, or dimension i'm pretty sure they'd realize that there's no need to do that um and that it's only going to lead to trouble i don't know i'm just throwing that out there because i i like to think about such things i don't know i mean i i think there is some research to suggest and i know it's counterintuitive but that that actually we're getting less violent and and more civilized and that yes i mean you get a distorted view of this through the media because as the old saying goes if it bleeds it leads but we've all seen and experienced acts of love of kindness of charity and i think it speaks to your point speaks to a wider question about the nature of altruism uh, and i mean true altruism not doing a good deed because we hope or expect we might get one back but doing it for the sake of doing it and i like to think as as i say if there are whole bunch of civilizations out there i like to think and hope that that there will be some altruistic ones too but i don't think there's any getting away from the fact that curiosity the desire to explore and see what's out there is although sometimes it's motivated by by you know the desire to acquire new resources often it is simply motivated by the the desire to seek information and knowledge knowledge for knowledge sake learning mm. it self improvement uh to to find more things of interest and diversity in the universe so i mean for example i often say that to advance civilizations out there a, a primitive emerging civilization like us is going to have nothing to teach them about science and technology but what if they were interested in the more abstract and and personal things like art literature music poetry uh, things like that uh, and and biodiversity and and in those circumstances there might be very good and high minded reasons for for traveling between the stars yes another reason i mention it is that if they did have this ability to travel I don't know we say this far but it, it like you say if you fold the bit of paper it's it's not far at all um but I just wonder if they would do it in a way that just wouldn't take up any more of the universe's resources than is sort of either replenishable or necessary hence this this maybe the the technology to travel this way doesn't require energy it requires something that we we can't yet comprehend yeah i i'm sure you're right that if if aliens were to arrive here tomorrow and land on the white house lawn i'm pretty darn sure they wouldn't be using chemical rockets or oil and gas or that sort of thing <laughs> now a whole bunch of theoretical physicists far far brighter than me i i doing some work to kind of figure out what kind of scientific understanding and technological know how might achieve something like that but that's that's way above my you know, level of of intellect i'm afraid <laughs> let's move move on i've written three things down here a, a little bit a, again another psyop if you ask me um that plays on the human's psyche again predominantly left brain psyche and that's the mandela effect which i'm sure you must be familiar with yes like oh. the fact that q 
Curious George, the monkey, has no tail. <laughs> oh, they haven't done that to him, have they? <laughs> I think, and yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of them, of course. And and the X Files famously had an episode on it. So so yeah, it's it's not something, it's not something I've studied personally, but it, it it's a bizarre thing. Now, is it is it just false memory and and the fact that we like to remember remember simple spellings, for example, whereas in fact some spellings are more complex. Or is there something else going on? I don't know, but it's it's bizarre. Yes, I would say some people some people say it's it's you know something to do with we've gone into one of those parallel word worlds or we've had leakage from another dimension. Yeah. Other people say it's like a glitch in the matrix. And, yes. and of course, for anyone who thinks, oh, The Matrix is just a sci-fi movie, uh, there are a number of people who seriously believe that we are living in a simulation. And I'll name no names, but there are a number of fairly well-known tech billionaires who are actively funding scientific research that's saying, first of all, I want to validate The Matrix, but then I want to bust out of it and see what's out there and talk to the people that made it and programmed it. <laughs> I mean, I laugh, but, but this is serious. People, people do believe this and people are funding it right now. Yes. So false memory syndrome is, is a thing, isn't it? We've all remembered that movie, uh, sorry, film, um, to our American brothers and sisters movie, where you went, yeah, and that bit where the guy did that and your mate goes, no, 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 no. He he did that, and and you have this argument, and and you you're just about to bet five hundred pounds that it was the way. I, and then you watch the film, and you're like, oh god, oh my god, you know, or or that person wasn't even in this film. I was so false memory syndrome is a thing, but again, this it it's become a psyop to alter certain things to fuel this movement this mandela movement so friends at home if you're wondering what the hell this is i'm sure many of you know what it is but it's just the way that some people swore that nelson mandela died in a certain year and when the the facts of the matter is he didn't he died years years later but many people have this memory of seeing his coffin seeing the funeral and it was maybe, say, 1991. Um, but, of course, he died. He didn't die until much later. But and then it, 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 it's drawn in all sorts of things, like, for example, people not realising the Ford emblem has a little, a little cross on the um, crossbar of the F. And... That there are photos out there where, where there isn't that little cross so it kind of didn't always have this cross and yet the idea is yes it always kind of did but here's where it gets here's where i think it's been influenced by uh, dark elements the same dark elements that want people to believe the earth's flat so that anyone questioning um official narratives looks looks like a bit is a, a, a bit of an idiot and that's where for example franco colombo who's an italian gentleman he was arnold schwarzenegger's best friend for all the bodybuilding years they both were there at venice beach lifting weights together they were both huge guys i was massively into at least reading about them if not trying to to, to emulate them and of course, it's an Italian name, so it's a it's a Latino of Latino origin. So it's an O on the end, Colombo. And yet now, it's been doctored everywhere to be Colombo with a U, which doesn't even really, unless I'm ignorant of of, 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 of languages, it, it doesn't even seem to be a, like Colombo. Um, and if you if you try and find articles now, or you try and find his books and stuff, it's all Columbo. 
I've never seen Arnold Schwarzenegger uh, questioned about this, by the way. That would be a that would be an interesting one. But then occasionally you get the odd bit of literature flags out, and no, there's his name, Franco Colombo. That was his name, Franco Colombo. Everyone knew it's Franco Colombo. So my guess would be that someone is playing on people's false memory syndrome. Well, if anyone's watching this and isn't quite clear what we're talking about, I would urge them to look it up. And there are many sites that list these are the top 10 or these are the top 20 examples. And I would urge people, have some fun with it. Go through them. And I guarantee you'll be going, hey, wait a minute. (laughs) Yes, and some of them really get you. I mean, some are obvious. For example, there's many people believe when JFK was shot in, in the automobile, there was only four people in it. Um, or at least four people in the back. Um, That just couldn't be true because the senator was also shot, wasn't he? So there was Jackie, JFK, the senator, I think it was his his wife, and then there were the the two CIA drivers, so there were six people. And that has to be five minimum because the senator was part of the subsequent um, inquiry, wasn't he, of the magic the magic bullet theory, mm-hmm. how it hit him and then it hit JFK because they had to explain this uh, incredible scenario, fictitious um, scenario. Um, so anyone say, no, there was only four people in the car, that, that, that just couldn't, couldn't be, although it, I get it. What they've probably done is they've seen a film where – They've just had four people in the car or they've seen a museum exhibit, which which there are, where they've just had the four people in the car. But one that was really hard to take is the the Jaws one in, in the James Bond film Moonraker. Where Jaws has come down, he's crashed in this cable car after the cable's been severed and he's there throwing off this bits of cable car in, in I can't even remember, remember where it was. And the, uh, let's say it's Switzerland and this local Swiss girl arrives on the scene to help him. And she smiles and then Jaws, this big um, villain character with the metal, the metal teeth, he smiles and everybody could swear the reason that they fell in love this couple is because she had braces on her teeth and that was what made that was why they made the connection and of course if you check the film now that she's got she doesn't have braces on her teeth um, i'm guessing she probably never did but the fact that years later there was a suit there was an advert i think for a credit card in which the same character jaws's character um it's paying for his his shopping in this uh, supermarket or store and the girl on the tail looks at him and smiles and she did have braces and so the idea is that that's implanted that memory back into people's minds who who watch the film yes i don't know what to believe but it's certainly one of the most intriguing little puzzles. And as I say, I I urge people to go to some websites and work through the examples themselves and and see what you all think. Now, I have had the privilege um, of both being a guest on and having him as a guest on my show, James Bartley. Are you familiar with James? Uh, I'm not. You may have to jog my memory. Uh, I'm going to put you guys in touch. You are just, you're going to It's going to be a house on fire. He's one of the world's leading experts, not just on the whole UFO field, but also of the abduction scenario. Um, James believes he was abducted as a child himself. And he his um, by the time our, our episode is aired, the episode I've just done with him recently should should have gone out to. And it's fascinating. He's very open. I, 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 we discuss the, for example, the possibility of childhood trauma. He was a military uh, child or his, his 
parents were in the military and I said possibly you know was your father away did you miss him was was you know did you go to strange schools was this sort of thing and and he was open to all he's a very very lovely gentleman and um but no Mate, he, where's where's he based he's um oh i've got to get this right he's in the usa now but he's got um our mixture of ancestry filipino spanish and right other, okay other, this sort of thing he's lived uh, on hawaii um but yeah you, you I'll, I'll put I'll, i you know i did i did years ago i i mean i years ago back in the 90s i wrote a book about abduction but i i have not i have not really looked at that for years now simply because i have i have been so focusing on these these sorts of government and military ufo cases with with pilots and radar operators and all the associated interest in congress and that's probably why I, um you know i've i've somewhat taken my eye off the abduction ball recently but it sounds as if i should dip back in well yes i mean i'm naturally i'd rather look for a, a plausible reason before i start going to something super now i mean i i think any sort of science based science minded person would do but like i said earlier i would never never dispute someone else's story if i hadn't lived it myself so it's interesting um i don't know if it's because i saw a film that had this same theme where this this I'm probably paraphrasing it, but there was a child swore they'd been adopted by aliens or they were a, a young ad adult, perhaps. And, and then it turned out that they'd been subjected to horrendous abuse and that somehow their mind was trying to block out this horrendous abuse by coming up with this scenario that it wasn't abuse. It was being abducted by by alien craft. And like I say, I'm not suggesting here, friends at home, that, that that's the case, but this is why we have these chats to consider all possibilities. Um, what what has been your experience of that? What kind of stories have you come across? Oh, I, I mean, a huge range, certainly. Um, there's a great quote in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, ordinary people in extraordinary situations. And I think you can you can apply that to UFOs, sure, but you can you can apply it to to these abduction accounts too. I think, as is the case with UFOs, it's very unlikely that there is a single explanation that explains all these cases. There are a multitude of different things going on. At at the one end of the spectrum, let's not kid ourselves, as with UFOs, some people are just making it up, um, you know, through most probably just attention seeking. Then some with some people, you mentioned this yourself, it may be that this is some distorted memory of some sort of childhood abuse, physical, sexual, um, emotional some combination of that. Some of these experiences may be attributable to extremely vivid dreams or hallucinations. Some may be the product of, of some sort of mental health issue. And as with UFOs, where you get this sort of 5% of, of cases that you can't explain in those conventional terms, there may be some of these cases that that are something else and now i i don't know whether that that something else is physically taken on board a spaceship and 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 all that supposedly comes with it but i i i don't mean to make light of this but i mentioned michio kaku earlier the theoretical physicist he he said something recently about abduction in a light-hearted way, but was a serious side. He said, next time someone gets abducted by aliens, steal something off the ship so that you can bring it back and, and we can test it in a laboratory because there'll be things like isotopic ratio analysis that will definitively prove 
whether or not it was manufactured on Earth. But you could get, you know, taken a court on Mars for bloody theft. <laughs> and those Martian prisons, you don't want to end up in one of those. <laughs> no, I've seen a sci-fi movie about that. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was a it was a lighthearted remark. But I suppose his serious point is we need we need something. See, with the UFO stories, we've got more than just the testimony. We've, we've got radar data. We've got photographs and videos. We've got Mazint on it. But with the abductions, frankly, we don't have a whole lot more than just a bunch of stories. And we need, we need to find a way to kind of elevate it to the next level. Yes. And also some UFO sightings. I was watching a lecture the other day. And the gentleman was pointing out how you can tell the difference between a government experimental craft and one that is just un unknown. So, for example, the, the, the Germans were supposed to have some fairly advanced technology. Do, do you have any idea how they're, I mean, I, I'm guessing they were just, a best effort at trying to create a, a flying saucer. But do we know how those were supposed to be propelled or, or? Not, not really. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I think, false claims circulating about so-called Nazi flying saucers. I mean, they were undoubtedly in many ways, their, their aviation and aerospace technology was ahead of the allies. I mean, the V1, the V2 in particular, uh, the ME262, really. Uh, so in terms of jet fighters and rockets, the Nazis were ahead. But the point was they developed them very late in the war by, by a time in which the Allied bombing campaign could largely flatten places like Peenemund, where, where a lot of this was being developed. Yes, the Nazis had a lot on paper, but as for operational craft, not so much. Now, some of the so-called flying wing aircraft developed, designed by the Horton brothers in, in Germany during the Second World War, did arguably act as the genesis for for aircraft like the, the, the B-2 stealth bomber. But I don't think they had quite as much developed as opposed to, to just theorized. It's funny that, isn't it? The Horton brothers, they're, they're doing their best to create our flying saucers and on, on some far distant planet, it's probably the, the Nanu Nanu brothers have <laughs> got their spanners out and, and, and they're, they're working on something. It, it, it all seems terribly um, human, doesn't it, when you, when you put a name to these uh, scientists? Well, yes, as above, so below. But um, certain things, certain, I mean, the laws of physics and the laws of chemistry seem to be the same in the observable universe. So arguably, any technological civilization that emerges in the observable universe, even though there's a, obviously a danger of anthropocentrism when it comes to figuring out what they would be doing and thinking, there are probably some commonalities. I, I mean, on, on, any, on any rocky terrestrial inner planet, um, probably the development of, of you know, the understanding how to harness and create fire is, is probably a prerequisite. Understanding and developing a written language so that information can be accurately conveyed from one person to another is, is probably a given. Uh, the wheel and ultimately the jet engine, simply because these things work according to fixed laws of physics and chemistry. So there will be, I'm sure, some commonality. And the other fascinating thing and, and I'll just give a quick overview of my understanding is both the Germans and, of course, the 
original rocket scientists who were in the desert out in California got to the point where they realized, hang on, we're not going to get a rocket into outer space using tradition, conventional thinking and traditional means, i.e. going with the laws of physics, as, as we know them, I mean. And so both parties, um, probably unbeknownst to each other, they both start to, to, to explore the occult. And I guess the thinking was, well, look, if we're going to get something up there, if we're going to make our, I mean, these are committed scientists that absolutely want to achieve their aim, but they, they, they're they frustrated because they're, you know, they're mixing together some gas and some solid fuel or whatever. And it's, it, it's, the rocket's going up a bit, but then it's just coming down again. And, um, this is why there's a fascinating history of the occult that runs through these programs. And you can, I believe you can still see in, in the, the, the big space organizations today. Is that something you've ever come across, Nick? Yes. Now, I, I'm not sure I completely agree with where you started out with that point, because I would say, I would say that there's, there's a natural progression of technology that that doesn't involve the occult, but simply involves our understanding of the laws of physics um, and our technological know-how to be able to exploit that increases. So, for example, when you move from a propeller aircraft to a jet aircraft, and then from a jet aircraft to the the rockets that that did take us to the moon, that that does not use an occult technology. I mean, that that just uses a new technology as our that's, as our understanding progresses that's if these, that's if these guys well these were the guys that then went to form nasa weren't they so the uh, the german scientists and and these uh yanks and so i'm not sure i'm not saying that there isn't a strong thread of occult belief mm. running through the establishment, um, because there is absolutely, I I agree with that. Now, whether it's produced tangible results or not, I don't know. It's certainly uh, you can see in some of the symbolism, e even in some of the 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 patches, you can see, for example, an obsession with Egyptology. Yeah, that that runs through a lot of this. So, for example, the the current sample return mission jointly being done by NASA and the University of Arizona is Osiris Rex. And, and it's like the idea of Osiris is our God, Os Osiris is our king, Osiris is returning. And you can, you can see that in, in, in the names that they give and in the symbols that they use. And, and, and it's not just that, it's, it's all over the place. Uh, yeah, that part of it I agree with totally. Yes, I just, um, I mean, I really think it's that. I really just think they got to a point where they, they, their dreams are not going to become a reality. So they just explored this other, another avenue, say. Personally, if you're asking me, I think kind of like witch, witchcraft, if we call it that, is a bit, mumbo jumbo <laughs> i saw saw a lot of it in africa funnily enough and gosh didn't the the, the locals in mozambique god oh, they believed all that stuff and it was um it was interesting to see but yeah sure who knows I, I mean maybe at some stage there's going to be a synthesis of of technology with the power of the mind and uh, consciousness but those are, are subjects i'm afraid that are well outside my my area of expertise. I, I have not studied consciousness. Many people have and and believe that it may be the key to things that that more conventional thinkers think can only be done through fairly hard tech. And I hope that's true. And you you hear people talk about the shamanic journey, for example. Mm. Uh, but again, I'm afraid it's it's not my it's not my field.
Yes, of course. Um, it was well, obviously not mine either. I think um, um, let's just say there's a few mind altering substances that uh, really do make you question the nature of reality. Um, so things like DMT, I'm guessing, and 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 this kind of thing. Uh, uh, you can see why it's tempting to to explore consciousness as a way of of, of travel. I mean, sure. And Nick, um, the final thing I've got written down here: Can we talk about your television um, experience? And you you've advised on TV series and and films. Am sure. I right? Yes. Well, one of the, one of the things that I do now is I act as as I do some consultancy work. So sometimes on films, someone will literally say, "Well, what should should our spaceships look like, and what should our aliens look like? What sort of things are people reporting and experiencing, and how would government really respond to this?" And sometimes that blends with spokesperson work, where when the movie comes out. I do some tie-in interviews, and and so something will come out: sci-fi blockbuster, UFOs, aliens, and part. I mean, the strand of the publicity will be they'll speak to to the actors and, and the director and things, and hey, talk us about your experience on this movie. But another strand of it will involve me, and the media interviews will start with something like, "Well, in the week in which the new X Files movie." Comes out. We talk to someone who's run a real life X Files program, and it's it's just another strand of the, the 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 kind of promotion of the movie, a way of interesting people in the question of how much, if any, of what you see in this science fiction is or might be science fact. So I've been lucky enough to be involved in a huge range of of movies and tv shows and then of course i do i do tv news bulletins so for example i've i've been on shows like newsnight and the today program uh, when a news story on this breaks i i've been on kids shows like blue peter i i've been on chat shows um i've i've been on the documentaries of course like like ancient aliens and things and i know there've been a few jokes in the ufo community uh, along the lines of you know you can't have a ufo documentary without nick pope in it well you you can but i i do seem to get my way in an awful lot of them and and it's it's interesting and it's fun and i see my role now as you know i've done i've done this for the the government so I see my role now as giving a sort of insider perspective on this and, and just trying to help kickstart a conversation which, which is being led in the United States, frankly, at the moment, through some of the things we talked about, the Navy videos and the report to Congress, but kickstart a conversation on how this is a serious issue. And it's not, it's not you know, science fiction is fun, but there is a reality here that that deserves our time. I mean, after all, what question could be bigger and more profound than are we alone or not in the universe? And, and maybe are we being visited? And I, if, if we can talk about those questions and maybe find our way to some answers, wouldn't that be great? It certainly would. My, my concern is, is when you hear Fox News um, taking up the subject, and their slant in it, slant is, yeah, we we've got to defend the skies, man. You know, they're, they're, they're coming for. Are we not going to see a false flag operation in which we're told aliens have landed or they've blown up some public building, and then we've all got to be terrified and give over more of our freedom to to the uh, trillionaire corporations? Do you think that's a possibility? I'm not convinced. I mean, I, I've heard the theory and I've heard that, that you know, maybe some sort of combination of, 
of Hollywood special effects and government psyop, um, you know, might create something like that. And then we get a Space Patriot Act, which, as you say, would sweep aside even more of our few remaining freedoms. Um, I, I'm not sure. And I should say, and maybe you're just being polite about it, but I, I, in the interests of full disclosure, I should say I have been accused of being part of, of that kind of threat narrative myself. I, it's not true. I'm simply, I'm simply trying to give an insider's perspective on how this topic is, is viewed in government. And I mentioned uh, right at the outset uh, the capability times intent equals threat equation. So that's all I'm applying. But yeah, I've, I've been accused of that. So if other people in the US, like Lou Elizondo and Chris Mellon, uh, all I can say, I mean, you mentioned Fox. All I can say is it's on, it's on CNN too and, and CBS and NBC and ABC, BBC, ITV, Channel 4, Channel 5. I mean, it's not a, it's not a party political issue. It's right. The, the media coverage of this is right on across the spectrum, left, right, and center. Um, so you don't, take buy, your, you, don't buy sorry, into, you don't buy into the notion it's just, was it, I think the same guy owns 98% of the media that we see, but it's one, one, one individual. Um, in fact, two corporations, BlackRock and Vanguard, have leading shares in every single company floated on the stock market. So basically two companies can pretty much control the, the world trade. Um, I think it when you start hearing these, what I would call cheesy news outlets selling the same narrative, I mean, where did where, I know people's ears are pricking up at home. Was where where did we hear that before? Um, I really do think it's a it's a possibility, Nick, that we that that they're going to try and cast another one of their spells on us. Well, all I can say is is on a personal basis, not guilty. No, and, no, no. Um... Uh, if, if 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 you're the biggest threat that they could put forward, then I. I I think we all know we're, we're quite safe, Nick. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, there is this idea that I and a, a number of individuals predominantly in the U.S. are, are deliberately promoting this threat narrative. All, all I can say is it's not true. And, and, but if, if anyone disbelieves it, there's probably nothing my denial will, will do. So it, it is what it is. I think I think that might be one of the I think the whole false flag alien invasion area might be one area where we we might you and I might have to agree to disagree, but then it would be a very boring podcast if we spent the entire time agreeing with each other. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm I like I say my jury's always out, Nick, on 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 stuff I can't prove, but I like to just consider sort of all, all the options, especially with. I'm just going to say the history of uh, the history of this planet. Let's move on, though, to the connection that has been suggested between an alien species and indeed our own. As in, I wouldn't say interbreeding, but maybe some sort of inter DNA. Uh, or possibly a bit of breeding, but with, with alien DNA. Um, quick synopsis for people at home. So again, feel free to correct me in the comments, but we're talking, is it the Nephilim and the Anunnaki and how these sophisticated beings from another place arrived on Earth? They implanted some of their slightly advanced DNA in, into primates, so monkeys, in order to create a slave race of which I guess that's us. I know that there's people strongly and fa fairly credible people strongly believe that the evolution thing is, is not, well, is a lie, basically. 
And I just wanted to get your, your thoughts on it, Nick. Well, I think there's two sides of this. First, it is undeniably true that people have always seen strange things in the sky. So, so the UFO phenomenon, though we focus on modern events, I mean, probably goes back to the dawn of time. And that ties in with so-called ancient astronaut theory, which, which you see most famously in TV shows like Ancient Aliens, where it is, it is alleged that we have been visited uh, since the dawn of time and, and perhaps influenced by or inspired by extraterrestrials who we have mistakenly perceived as and worshipped as gods. That's one side of it. I don't know about that. Then, then there's the second side, which, which you may be more focused on, the idea that, the, that there's been this sort of direct intervention that we have been almost seeded and you know, part of a breeding program, a hybridization program, whatever it might be. Uh, frankly, I don't believe that at all. I'm actually rather a fan of conventional evolutionary theory. I think the, the human ape split was somewhere between five and seven million years ago. Anatomically modern humans emerged, I think, about 200,000 years ago. And I don't, I don't see any need for or evidence of alien intervention in that. But as you say, many people believe otherwise. I don't know. Is it the missing link is where it, this is what we, 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 we find it hard to bridge this gap, don't we? Because we, we want concrete evidence and it just it kind of isn't isn't there because of the missing links. Well, I think it's just because it's so difficult to find stuff. I mean, uh, you know, everything gets gets deposited and buried under various different layers. And then a lot of it's in parts of the world that are difficult to access. And, and then we build over things. And uh, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that, that we, we don't have, you know, that there are gaps in, in our understanding of things. Uh, and, and rising sea levels, of course, have, have, you know, whether you believe it's, it's natural part of the cycle or, or, you know, given a, a boost by our own more modern industrial age activities, but sea levels have been rising and, and covering up lots of the evidence of, of course, particularly of early, early human settlements. But, but again, that's not really my area of, no. of expertise. Fascinating though it is. For anyone interested, I strongly recommend checking out Robert Seffer's channel. I, from what I understand, he's a very nice guy, Robert. He, he seems to feel that we've been a bit misled simply because the DNA chain doesn't, doesn't pan out to one evolution. He's, he says human beings have very distinctly different um, lineage. Um, but, of course, the other thing, Nick, is – and this is probably we might be veer, veering away from UFOs here, but the uh, the advanced civilizations that seem to have gone before us, of, of which now there's very little understanding, except for things like the pyramids that are left behind, and also some of these um, structures in South America. I've seen I've seen some of these um, ancient buildings. And literally, the stonework is so perfect, you couldn't you couldn't put a piece of paper between these huge blocks. And some of these blocks are weighing 40, 40 tons each. Um, so, yes, it all does. It all kind of intertwines a bit and gets a bit interesting. Sure, I know people like Graham Hancock and Robert Boval have done a, a lot of work into those sorts of theories. Yes, Fingerprint of the Gods is a, a book that's um, well worth a read. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Nick, listen, you've been absolutely wonderful. So, um, thank you so much for bringing your, 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 your knowledge and your expertise. Um, 
what's we we'll, I'd like you to give your books a mention if you if you would, and also your website. And we'll put a link below. Sure, I've written uh, a book on UFOs called Open Skies, Closed Minds. A book on alien abductions called The Uninvited. A book specifically on the Rendlesham Forest UFO case, uh, just called Encounter in Rendlesham Forest. I've written two science fiction novels, Operation Thunderchild and Operation Lightning Strike, about the RAF and MOD response to an alien invasion. And I've written uh, nothing to do with UFOs, a thriller called Blood Brothers, which is about a multi-agency team of special forces and intelligence community personnel hunting down terrorists in the UK. Um, that's my most recent book, Blood Brothers. All of this and more general information about my government work on, on this subject can be found on my website, which is nickpope.net. And that also links to my social media and my Twitter is at Nick Pope MOD for Ministry of Defense. So at Nick Pope MOD, but it's all linked to from nickpope.net. Brilliant. A massive thank you again. Just Nick, stay on the line until I hit the record button off so I can thank, thank you properly. Um, Will do. To our friends at home, if you've made it this far, massive thank you for staying with us. If you could like and subscribe, um that would help i hope you've enjoyed this as much as as i have we've i've tried to do my best here with uh sort of fringe fringe knowledge and um i guess the truth is out there <laughs>